Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo sadando suche do ye hola di san miao san putoshi. Namo sadanto suche do ye hola di san miao san putoshi. Wu sha shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou shi. Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. This is the 20th of September. We're leaving Virgo behind, heading over into Libra, and we're here at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. We're going to be talking about the Flower Garland Sutra, the Ten Grounds chapter. And please join with me. But I want to mention, first of all, how guai guai our men are. Notice they're all sitting in the front row, leaving not a single seat vacant. How well-behaved and tinghua they are. Uh, well done, men's side. Um, <coughs> hint, hint. So, please turn to the front cover and let's invoke the Avatamsaka Sutra and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo da fang guang fu hai yen
Everybody turned off their weapon of mass communication. This device. By the way, anybody have a six yet? Nobody in the room lined up overnight. Nobody up above. No, no. We uh, some people in our community proudly showed on Facebook their brand new iPhone six that they stood in line to get. Um, in London, people were in line for, for two days to get the new iPhone. When does the madness stop? I mean, this began with like the three and then the four and the five. And so Apple has a good thing going that they can get people to interrupt their lives for two days to get in line to buy a product. You know, not bad. Um, before we begin, um, I'm going to tune my guitar so it can uh, be settling uh, because it's in a different tuning and if I if I try to play it in the new tuning without letting it settle it will not please so let me retune it There is happiness in the uh, acoustic guitar community recently because um, our friend and benefactor Al Petaway, um, who has been to the monastery, um, had both he and his wife Amy had uh, several tunes selected for the Ken Burns documentary on the, the uh, Roosevelt's. Did anybody watch? Roosevelt's, some, yeah. Well, Al's music is, uh, half a dozen of his pieces were picked, so. Thank you. 
So Al has been um, creating these tunes seemingly out of the air. And uh, it's nice to get some recognition every now and then. it and when it comes time to use it later it will be ready all right appreciate your patience let's turn in our texts to page eight and nine Ba we're up at the top of the page And we'll begin with Fordzi up at the top. Here we go. Fordzi Sosa Ru Shi Guan Yi Fu Yi Da Bei Wei Shou Da Bei Zeng Shang Da Bei Man Zu Guan Shi Jian Sheng Si I'm sorry, my, my mistake. Guan Shi Jian Sheng Mie Fu Zuo Shi Nian Shi Jian Shou Sheng Jie Yu Zhao Wo Ruo Li Ci Zhao Zi Wu Sheng Chu Okay, over to the right. Disciple, let's read it together in unison. Ready? Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha when the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, makes these contemplations, he also puts great compassion first. His great compassion increases and develops it to fullness and perfection. He sees how worlds are created and destroyed, and he thinks, everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self. Once someone gets free from that attachment, rebirth has nowhere else to stand. All right. Um, I've come to believe that sutras have their following. That's what Shifu always said, and I've experienced it. I never know from week to week who's going to show up to listen to the sutra. That's true here, it's true in CTDB, it's true in San Jose, and in Singapore. And sutras have their following. And you never know from week to week. Um, people who are connected to certain dharmas come for that teaching and they won't miss it. They will not fail to be there. Other people, you pay them. They won't show up if they don't have the connection. And we're talking about prajna, and I'm, I'm aware that the last couple lectures have been, the last three lectures have been uh, energized, um, energetic, and I found 
to my surprise that I was actually able to talk about emptiness and not sound silly, you know, not sound ridiculous. And there was a, a momentum building in the room talking about emptiness. But this is a difficult dharma to explain and not everybody wants to come. Um, so, that's just to say, what? What am I saying? Uh, people are connected to different kinds of dharma. The way restaurants, restaurants draw a crowd. Uh, they say that every Jewish person in New York City eats Chinese food at Christmas. Were you aware of that? That's true. If Chinese restaurants all closed in New York at Christmas, uh, people, the Jewish population of New York City would be very upset. Uh, Certain, you know, who would think, right? And uh, Berkeley is the home of fusion cuisine, Alice Waters with her new American cuisine. And Berkeley is also justifiably famous for its Mexican restaurants. Just certain kinds of food draw certain people in. Italian food has its own following. And, and uh, uh, Ethiopian, who would think that Ethiopian food and Thai food, Thai food is justly famous. And so sutras are very, very much the same way. Certain, certain sutras draw a certain uh, audience. I think there, maybe there's a color, maybe there's a sound, a vibration rate that hits our vibration rate and brings us here. Uh, so we're looking into the sixth ground and the Dharma, the overall Dharma that's being talked about is called the 12 links of conditioned arising, Pratitya Samutpada, it's called. That's the, uh, the name for it. And we've been kind of preparing and preparing and giving the, the lead up, giving the preamble, the preface to jumping right into this. Um, We're keeping time with the sutra itself because, you know, each of these ten grounds, there's definitely an approach to it. There has to be a request. And in this case, the, uh, the, in the ten grounds chapter, the person doing the request is called Jieto Yue Pusa, moon of liberation, Bodhisattva. Moon in the sky, liberation meaning you go free, get free. And so moon of liberation, Bodhisattva, is asking for for the Dharma from another Bodhisattva whose name is Vajra Treasury. Treasury of Vajra Bodhisattva is the speaker. And he is standing in for the Buddha. So it's this interesting conversation going on. Uh, the Buddha, speaking the Dharma, through someone else. He gives him the blessing to go ahead and speak the Dharma about the Ten Grounds. So explain this method, this technique. So we talked about that. What's the main topic? Pratitya samutpada. How things arise because of conditions and they go away because of conditions. There are people who will say, and this is my uh, academic advisor, Dr. Nakasone, who studied the Avatamsaka at Wisconsin and then went on to become a, a Japanese Pure Land priest, a Jodo Shinshu priest. He says, and he quotes a whole tradition, that says, of all the things the Buddha spoke, this is the most unique. This is the Buddha's signature teaching. Not emptiness, but emptiness as the preface to the 12 links of conditioned arising. Okay, so it's like, when he said that, it was like, really? You know, I never heard that. But he said, oh, yeah. of all, you, you know, they can say karma and cause and effect. The Hindus have that. That's not unique, right? Cause and effect, the idea that we are reborn, that we create ac actions here that have a force that lead us into our next rebirth. That's pretty much shared over Asia. Uh, what's another one? Um, the idea of the devas in the heavens come down and interact with humans. The, the six paths of rebirth. There are the hells, the animals, the ghosts, the shuras, the devas, the humans. 
That's shared with other teachings. The Greeks talk about ideas like that. That's not unique. This is unique. Only the Buddha saw this, according to a certain school. This was the Buddha's wisdom vision, as we've been saying, lifting the hood on the engine of the universe. What drives our lives? What powers us down the road? What's really going on when you meet somebody, when you can't meet somebody you want to, when you suffer, when good things happen and you get delight in your life, the engine making that work is conditioned arising. Yin guo shun huan, yin yuan fa, shi er yin yuan, the 12 links of conditioned arising. So, you know, when I heard him say that, I was going, whoa, really, no kidding, that's, who talks like that? Who says that? Not the Chinese Mahayana, but if you look at it, yes, it is. The Chinese Mahayana does talk about this, but this is a Dharma shared between the Theravada and the Mahayana, like the four truths in the Eightfold Path, right? The Four Noble Truths, they say, hallmark Theravada Dharma. This is what Ajahn Sumedho speaks about so well, you know, and all the monks, Ajahn Amaral. Well, the Eightfold Path, Likewise, is one of those teachings that you kind of hear on the fourth day of the retreat. If you're in a week-long retreat, it, it's not the first thing. It, it's, it's a midstream dharma. The 12 links is the next one, or maybe people don't quite get there. But when you do, you realize, wow, this is powerful, deep stuff. This is what's really going on in our lives. So how about that? So we're just kind of advertising. We're not there yet, but I'm just telling you why this is so important. It's not simple. Many people don't want to look at it. It's why there's no feeling here. The last three weeks I've been talking about this text as a science text. You know, if you look at the... I don't know if anybody has... I, I avoided chemistry. I took chemistry in summer school and got a C. My, my worst grade in high school was my chemistry grade. Not there. It's not happening with me in science. But, or it could have been the professors. But I don't want to blame them. I just don't have that ability. And so my summer school grade was a C in chemistry. And I know that there's the periodic table of elements. How many are there now? Two hundred and... 180, something. They're still inventing them. And a lot of them are invented 15 minutes from here, right up the hill. Um, I took a Chinese literature class in, what's the name of the hall? And the, uh, the room next to the room where my Chinese literature class met had a metal plaque outside the door. And it said, inside this room, Californicum was invented was discovered. Uh, and then down the hall, inside this room, Linus, not Linus Pauling, uh, we have three or four Nobel Prize winners at Cal who invented some of the, discovered the, the fundamental building blocks of the universe in that room, right? And you go, oh my goodness, whoa, that's cool. That's history in terms of science. So the fundamental building blocks that chemistry talks about are called the periodic table of elements. So, what is water made of? Water is H2O, okay? Hydrogen to oxygen. So, the hydrogen and oxygen are pieces of that periodic table. Put them together, water occurs. All right? Carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon oxygen 2, is that gas that comes out of uh, our lungs, we're breathing it right this instant, and plants take it through their leaves and are very happy and transform it into oxygen. And so you break it down. So it's, that's what this chapter is talking about, is the periodic the table, of, periodic table of elements of our, our experience as humans in a body in a world. That's 
the, what the 12 links is talking about. In other words, all phenomena, everything that happens, is governed by a series of rules. Here's the rule book. That's what it is. It's not compassion. There's no talking here about, in, in the, once we get into the heart of it, about the bodhisattva, uh, you know, being one with everyone. What are we talking about here? Emptiness. As the condition whereby we go out and create blessings or commit offenses. And then how we do it. So, I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I'm just giving you a sense of, when we started tonight, there were not so many people in the hall, and you think, who's got connection with this text? Who's got the affinities with this text? So we'll find out. It's very powerful. And for me it's a challenge because I've never tried to take it on directly. I've never tried to explain this before. So we are at the preamble. The preamble is coming to a close. This is the preparation before we jump right into Wu Ming Yuan Xing. Xing Yuan Shi Shi Yan Ming Si Ming Si Yan Chu. Liu Ru, right? Ignorance creates, li ignorance links to and brings along activities, actions. Actions link to and pull out consciousness. Link number one, link number two, all 12. Leading to what? Old age, sickness, death, and all the suffering that comes from that. Half of the story. Flip it over. If you can unlink them, old age, sickness, death, and all that suffering come to an end. That's what's at stake. This is the description of why people come here and why we die. It's like, oh good, that sounds like fun. I, I could probably get back. I think there's a football game on. I, well, I'll get the second half, you know. Go team. Rather than talk about birth and death, no, come on, lighten up. No, this is the real dharma of birth and death. Can you stand it? Can you bear it? Right? Okay, enough of the preface, let's get to it. Fozi, disciples of the Buddha, Tsi Pusa Mohasa, Rushi Guanyi, our bodhisattva, our six stage bodhisattva, who is a Mahasattva, somebody who's a graduate. This is the champion of Bodhisattvas, looks at things that way. Rushaguani. Having looked at things that way, contemplated inside, which is what we just finished talking about how all dharmas are the same, and there were ten ways that they were the same. And the Bodhisattva got to patience, because why? He or she was noticing that the world was breaking up around him. Things were breaking up. Nothing was solid, starting with his body. Remember, we were talking about that? And what did it take? It took patience to sit through that. You're meditating along, and you realize that your body just vanished. You feel like air or your body is extremely hot, or cold, or any of the things that happen when you meditate to a certain point. And the form skanda, the body skanda, doesn't seem as solid as it was before. Okay, example. Take a saucepan, take a, you know, the, the pan that you heat up soup in, and put water in it and put it on the stove and <coughs> turn the heat on. You have gas or electricity, doesn't matter. And watch. And we've all done this, probably today we've all done it. And you watch and nothing happens and then there's a little bubble and there's ten bubbles and there's a hundred bubbles and then it starts to do this and then starts to right? The water's boiling. That's what happens when you sit still long enough and the form skanda 
starts to behave in a way it never did before. What are we talking about? Your body. Your body changes. What about that pain in your knees? When was the last time you meditated? Everybody, don't have to tell me, but think about it. How were your knees? How long did it take? I remember uh, Gold Mountain. Um, there's a real advantage to cultivating with friends because we would uh, you'd find a buddy. With, in my case, it was Hung Zuo, was the uh, Gary Linebarger, was the guy who would, we were both laymen in Gold Mountain at the same time. And we would sit next to each other and wait for the pain to become unbearable as the incense burned down, right? We were sitting 60 minute periods. So the, the incense and the burner, we're gonna sit there until the fire goes out, timed by incense. Zuo xiang, xing xiang, right? You sit to the incense, walk to the incense. We were sitting there and he was, he had a, he'd been, he had had a head start. He'd been meditating longer than I had. And we're sitting there and at about 45 minutes, I was ready to <sighs> thump, you know, defeated. Oh man. Or if you're, if like the teacher's walking around, it's like that. Put your leg down, right? Because that takes the pressure off that joint, which is extremely painful. And you get into these strange states where you're talking to your knees. You know, <laughs> like, be patient. I'll give you a cookie if you can be sit there. Just wait another five. You're not going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You're not going to die. I'm going to die now. I died already. Just be patient. You're sitting there talking to your knees. You know, and you and you don't want to open your eyes and look and see if he's already dropped his legs because that gives you an ex. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like. But it helps to know that he hasn't, so you don't dare, you know. If he has, then you quit too. And so it's good to have a buddy going through this thing. So who of you knows what I'm talking about as you're meditating? Your knees go on fire. It's true. And if you've never sat, never challenged yourself to sit long, you don't know what I'm talking about. Try it. And at first, I, I was completely immersed in this with my bond students uh, this last semester, last year, because they were fresh college students meditating for the very first time, 33 of them. They had never crossed their legs. And they brought with it all this innocent attitude. This can't, what, what's the big deal about this? Come on. You, you, everybody can meditate, so nothing to it. Cross their legs. Five minutes was the average. Five minutes they were squirming and grabbing for their phones just the way babies grab for the bottle. It's like, you know, <laughs> you know, safe with the phone. The phone provides this zone of familiar safe ground, you know. And then it was like, oh, that hurts. Who said anything about it hurting? Oh, you notice that. Oh, Oh, well, no, don't worry about it. You'll get better. Try it. Let it hurt. You're telling us hurt is good? Our culture does not validate hurt as good, right? We have Tylenol. We have aspirin. We have how many other painkillers, right? We have alcohol. We have retail therapy, all the ways that we avoid hurt. So just sit still, you know, six minutes. Just try six. If it hurts at five, take it to six. If it hurts at six, take it to seven. Just give yourself a little challenge. By the end of the semester, these students were going, they're writing me in their journals. They said, well, I sat on the beach, you know, for like a half an hour and I was listening to the waves and I sat there for like, like 40 minutes, not even noticing the time because the sound was so, so uh, soothing, you know. Or uh, the one woman whose mother uh, had, I guess it was her brother, had a serious accident back home in America. And she was so worried about her, her brother, whom she loved, that she said the only thing that got her mind to be quiet was meditation. And so she'd meditate for a long, long time. And, and I, I read this journal anonymously to the rest of the class, and they're all going, wow, she sat for how long? You know. So this is all illustration of the point that what happens 
when the bodhisattva is able to see how dharmas are all empty and therefore the same, it's because he or she has experienced the breakup of something that before this seemed very solid, our bodies. Sit still, simple, dead simple method of testing it out. Sit still with your legs crossed and you will experience changes in what's called the form skanda. What is it? Earth, air, fire, and water held together in the male form or the female form, the young form or the old form, by what? The glue of our karma is what sticks these elements together temporarily. We change before our eyes. We're changing. This cohesion of earth, air, fire, and water is very fragile. Cross your legs. How long does it take before it starts to be so painful? Okay, now, if you have never encountered this experience, you're gonna, I might scare you away from ever wanting to try it. It sounds pretty unattractive, doesn't it? Everybody's different. On the other side of the pain is no pain. There's an experience called passing through the pain gate that happens to sincere meditators. And that was Master Hua's job in the Chan session. Shifu would tease, threaten, coax, joke, push, trick us into sitting still. Tease us, trick us, fool us, threaten us, tease us into anything that would get us through that pain gate into the state where the pain goes away. All right? Now I'm way off my sutra. I'm digressing strongly, but we're talking about that meditation experience and I want people to not hear the about the skandhas breaking up and think, that's just too weird, I'm out of here. Right? I don't want you to have a negative takeaway from this. Shurfu would do anything he could to get us to sit still until what? The chi and the shue, the energy of the body, the breath, the pneuma in the body, and the blood to re-channel themselves into this form which is an ancient alchemical form. Full lotus is a bit of alchemy. There are circuits, there are meridians that are reconnecting when we sit still this way that when you do allows you to do what? Enter samadhi. It's not intuitive. It doesn't make sense at the start that there's anything good gained by sitting through knee pain. Shurfa would say, try it. And then he would do anything it would take to get us to experience it ourselves because through that pain gate, you can reach what? The dhyanas. Where there's joy and happiness and bliss and pleasure that you never experience on this side of that pain gate, which is just normal flow of energy going to birth and death. All right? If you can actually do this and sit still and be patient while the circuits reconnect, you, you yourself taste that incredible liberation from pain of any kind and the joy that waits for the body to re-knit itself back together in a whole new way. Okay, so just that's enough said on that. But what's going on is the skandhas, this, these heaps that make up our body, earth, air, earth, air, fire, and water, you experience in your own scientific laboratory are not so solid. They're not a permanent dharma. They're changing all the time. And you can let our, we can let our karma 
change them for us and we flow with it or we can take charge of their changes through using what? The Dharma. The Dharma can be seen as a form, as a container to shape the four elements, our form, feelings, thoughts, activities, consciousness, skandhas, into the form of bodhisattvas, buddhas, sages. So that's what that's about. All right. So here is this chapter is talking about how that works. What's going on? And it begins for the place where the bodhisattva has been sitting long enough to experience that breakup and has seen emptiness at the core of that experience going on. If you trace these things back, earth, air, fire, and water, there's nothing to hold on to at all. It all goes back to the nature. And what was the nature? We were struggling with it last week. It was the nature of all dharmas is pure, which we identified as a nonsense phrase at the, on the face of it. But when you put it into the experience of a meditator, that's right. My experience is that you can't hang on to any piece of this. My teeth go back to purity, i.e. nothing to hold on to. My blood, the liquid parts, goes back to nothing to hold on to. The spaces in my body, the emptiness of the blood vessels, goes back to nothing. The warmth goes back to nothing. And yet, somehow it's me, here I am, I'm, I'm here, aren't I? You know, well, when you see it break up and go away, it scares you to death. So what do you need? Patience at that point. You have to be patient. Because why? The Buddha is saying, yes, it all goes away. It'll come back. But it'll come back in a whole new form, free of attachment to self and to dharmas. Just practice step by step regularly and the Dharma will take you across that fear. And if you're patient, you're going to be reborn from the Dharma. Because why? That's what he was doing for six years in the woods. That's what the Buddha was doing, was waiting out that experience in the forest outside the palace. And he did. He made it through to the other side, got through the gate, and became the Buddha. What was different on the other side? We're going to find out tonight. Fu Yi Da Bei Wei Shou. He contemplates how all things break up and they all break up. There's nothing that doesn't break up. They're ping dong. They're identical in their emptiness. And he can stand it. He doesn't force it to be the way he thought it was. He realizes the way it really is has nothing to do with his thoughts about it. And something happens. Three kinds of da bei happen. He takes da bei, great compassion, as shou, head, in other words, foremost. Two, he takes great compassion and makes it grow. Zeng shang. Great compassion grows. Furthermore, da bei manzu. Great compassion fills him up or her up. Okay. In other words, the sutra is saying, look at great compassion three times. Why? Why does great compassion come out at this point? It's because the bodhisattva saw that thing happening to him and he realized it happens to everybody the same. We are all in the midst of a world where nothing lasts, but we get confused and we take stuff as lasting and we grab on it and we hurt. We can't hold on to anything and because we do to the degree that we hold on to it, that's the degree it hurts. That's why. And he realizes the experience he just had is true for everybody, but he now sees it. Most people don't. So what does he do? He goes, oh, I see. I see what's happening. I see what's happening. 
and it hurts. And he decides to do something about it, which is wake people up. How much does he see? Guan Shi Jian Sheng Mie. He sees how things are born and die. He sees how things come into being entirely and pass away. That's how deep he can see it now. He has lifted the lid on reality, on the play, to the point where he can see the entire cycle of things coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. He connects it completely. He completely sees how it works. So think about that. Um, we had these uh, uh, little babies in here today. Today was a big day of families. And there was uh, one little girl whose name is Serene. And Serene is a terror. <laughs> Serene is like, there's nothing that she doesn't want to put her fingers on and put on her mouth and ding and bang and break. and oh, she's, she's so cute. She's walking around, you know, testing everything. And all the adults and her, little, her older sister are running to get her to stop kicking the box with her heels right in the middle of my Dharma talk, you know. Serene is like, bum, 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 bum. She's really, really cute. She's totally like, hey, you know, totally innocent. And uh, she was there, and then An's granddaughter was here who has one braid in the top of her head, you know, that Chinese hairstyle for babies where you stick a braid up. And she's running around. And I'm sure the experience of being a mom must be uh, bittersweet because this baby, you know, is part of your body and yet they grow so fast and you can see them sticking their finger in the fire just because that's how they learn. And you have to, you can either say, don't do that and grab their hand back or you can let them Experience it so they won't do it a second time. What's it like to be a, the owner of somebody else's body, you know, the mother of the child? And you see it go from nothing to growing up and yet you can't own it because it's, it's not you, it's them, and yet it came from you. That must be very bittersweet. And here's the Bodhisattva who's able to see stuff come and go, come and go, come and go. He connects the circle entirely around. He's, he's able to see contemplating, right? Guan, he's not watching it. It's, this flower is not going to wilt in front of your eyes. But you know, because you've gardened enough, that this is going to be compost in a few weeks. It's going to just be discarded. It becomes matter Carbo, carbon, what, hydrocarbons that just become dirt, you know. And the Bodhisattva sees that and goes, hmm, I know what that's like. This is going to do it too. This is also compost. But it's not. That's your mom. That's not your daughter. That's your teacher. How can this be compost? Yes, it is. He sees the entire circle of how stuff comes and goes. He sees how worlds are created and destroyed. Truly, from start to finish, all the way through. And what does that do to you when you realize nothing lasts and you actually see it? Does it scare you? Does it depress you? Does it energize you into getting into action? What does he say? Here we get a piece of Bodhisattva's wisdom. Remember last week I said this sentence is key, key Buddhist teaching that comes out of the Avatamsaka into circulation in the world. This one, if you had only this sentence, you'd have some Dharma wisdom for your whole life. What is it? He says, 做十年, 世间受生皆有着我, Everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self. Once someone gets free from that attachment, rebirth has nowhere left to stand. 
What's the secret to ending birth and death? The Buddha would say, work on the self. Can you unpack the self and see through it and put it down? If so, you don't come back. You're free. You've done what the Buddha would call the one great matter. Ending birth and death. So, what was the Buddha's project? The Buddha, the prince's project was, he saw something ahead that he had no context for. He saw quickly in visits to the city outside of his pleasure dome, right? He stepped out of the, the, the fantasy house and saw somebody old, somebody sick, and a dead body. And it shocked him. Totally shocked him. He had no understanding of, no place to put that knowledge. And he said, can that end? Has anybody defeated that? And then he saw the fourth messenger, which was the monk or the cultivator, who said, I cultivate the way that ends birth and death. Aha, it can end. The Buddha said, that's what I'm going to do. And that insight was enough to get him to totally step away from the king's throne, his wife, his son coming, his child, all of the power the glory, the honor, the majesty of being a king of India. He said, who cares? That's just like a TV show. That's just like a movie. I don't want that. I want to end birth and death. I don't want to go through old age, sickness, and death in darkness, ignorant. So I got to go. So, okay, that insight was so powerful. That's what the Buddha was about. And when I, I remember um, seeing that, I think I was reading the Avatamsaka and just talking about the Bodhisattva's uh, ended birth and death for himself and was willing to come back and take, take other people to that awareness, however he could. And it stuck with me, you know, and those words, that was the Buddha's project. The prince had that on his mind. The fire in his stomach that, that he had to solve that one. And that seems so simple and so clear that that's what it was about to begin with. And then helping others solve that too. I went to China and I remember being involved in a uh, this forum and there were what, 6,000 people there and uh, maybe, you know, 900, 1,200 monks, all with their beads and all with their, their bags and their red envelopes and their attendants and their cars and their, their styles and their, you know, the big actors in the play. These are big cheeses in the Buddhist church. And it was an immersion into the, the church of Chinese Buddhism, this structure, this institution, which has been there for so long. And from one perspective, it's very corrupt because it's about money and power and buildings. And, you know, on the other hand, it's historically magnificent that it's still there and it's thriving in China. And seeing all of this stuff, and watching uh, how you, okay, here, here's an example of what I was reacting against is the Waino, the, the master who started the first sound of every ceremony. When he does the incense praise, the first note, there's a competition to make that first note distinctive. And so the Waino goes, that's for the sangue e and mm. 
Shang and that's everybody does the same two songs, the same Lu Shang Zan and Sang Gui. And how are you going to know if you're any good or not? You have to make it distinctive. You have to make it special. You know? And watching these young monks full of their energy and their chi just out there giving it their best, you know. And, and now, from a musical point of view, I mean, it was incredibly far out, you know, and I was there recording and listening. But from the point of view of performance they were competing they were simply you know it was masculine macho buddhist ceremonies you know listen to me i got the best oh boy oh boy and i remember i came back from that and uh, i tried it for a ceremony and sherful was right there and he scolded me so hard he cut me off in the middle of the, you know, the Lu Shang Zan and said, you know, what do you think you're doing? You want the girls to look at you? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, and in fact, that was part of the motive. Look at me. I can do this better and different than anybody. There was, I mean, what's the difference between that and like, you know, uh, Bono on U2, you know, or, or Mick Jagger, you know, Jumpin' Jack Flash is a gas, 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 you know, and it's nothing, it's the same. It's worldly. It's showing off your pipes and your stuff. And you go, what is this? Institution. It's an institution. This is what happens when you do what? Forget the Buddha's project. What was the Buddha about? The Buddha said, I don't want to get old. I don't want to die. I don't want to be sick. Can it stop? And he saw that cultivator and said, yes, it can. Follow me. Here's the Tao. Walk the Tao. You will end birth and death. He said, I'll do it. I'll get rid of everything in order to do that. If I can do that, this stuff is useless. It's just a TV show. You hit the remote, chunk, it's over, right? But birth and death, when it ends, you're free, right? So that was the project. And it gave rise to this, in all its, and this is Chinese Buddhism. The Tibetans have their own institution. The Thais have their own institution. You know, the Japanese have this incredible, inst- the buildings and the architecture and the, the money, you know. You go, how funny. Boil it down. It's this experience here. Which is what? If you can see through the self, birth and death ends. How does it work? After I saw that, but Shurfu helped so much by just stopping me in mid, just come. What do you think you're doing? You know. So, how do we do it? Okay, Jin Fo, Jin Fan, Marek. Okay. Two. To the Buddha. Okay, why? You're starting the pitch. To, everybody hears that, they go, okay, we're going to go to, to the, you're starting the pitch, you're giving, you're t- giving people the downbeat. Da, 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 di, 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 right? That note is necessary. You give people the note to start on, you get us all in the same direction. There's a purpose for that. But you don't want to go the Buddha, you know. No. That's to forget. That's to go into Frank Sinatra territory, you know, and forget about birth and death. So, we do it, but we do it simply. I do, I came back and, and the Chinese monks hear me do it and they laugh. They go, <laughs> boy, America, forget that. There's, how can you show off your, your style if you don't? We go, right? 
da di di da 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 di. So you've outlined the the, the scale. Da di da dum. That's very helpful. Da di zi. Da di di da 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 dum. We'll be singing there. That's useful. That's helpful to get everybody started together. And you make your breathing audible. Okay, that is where you a signal to everybody in the room to go, right? So you're launching, you're the choir master for everybody with you by that simple act. But when you go beyond that into adornment, you're showing off. You leave the choir master and you become a soloist of the worst kind. Listen to me, everybody. Right? The good wayno vanishes. He's starting everybody off and then he goes away. Right? Why? He wants to get rid of the self and start the ceremony. What's the point of the ceremony? Chang Zan Rulai. Praise the Buddha. That's why you're doing this. It's a chance to let everybody join together to praise. In this case, the incense praise. That's a valuable act. You need somebody there. But once you point everybody in the right direction and say, start here on this note all together now. By, stop, by leaving that silence, you pull everybody in. You fill the space with everyone. So it's, there's definitely a technique, but then you go away. You get out of the way so that the self can vanish and the Dharma can arise. So, how powerful it is to say, get rid of the self, death has nowhere to, to land. Why? What died? There's nothing there that dies. All you have is earth, air, fire, and water and your karma swirling around with no pin in the center to pin all those strands, the, with no string holding all the flowers, the garland just becomes a heap of flowers. Now, does it really? Well, your karma pulls it right back together. But if you understand that the self is that string that holds the flowers together in the huaman, in the garland, or the beads, think of your beads, right? You break that string, which is the self, and all the beads go... How powerful is this? Everything in the world that is born is, is born because of an attachment to wo. So key to understanding this is what is the wo? It's not okay to say ego. You can't use the word ego. It's really tempting to use the word ego because it sounds like the term that psychoanalysis, psychotherapy uses to talk about the big me. Why can't we use the word ego here as the translation for war? Because in practice it seems to be the same thing. It's because ego is not well understood and is not contained yet. Ego first came into common usage from Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis of the human personality. So Sig Sigmund Freud was a genius doctor in Vienna at the turn of the century. And his analysis of rich Jewish women in Vienna, by and large, that was his, his clientele, he came up with these theories about the components of the psyche, of the personality. Included ego, 
super ego and the id and the libido and he gave them Greek names to these things that he identified bit by bit as making up our inside our insides so exactly what is the ego well you'd have to go back if you really wanted to do a responsible job go get Freud you know off your bookshelf from your college psychology class or do like everybody else and go to Wikipedia and look up ego and it'll give you a thumbnail of what the ego is and that kind of research is more and more and more acceptable because you know I've written articles for Wikipedia and you do your best so ego it's a moving target it's not a clear thing this is clear if anything if, it, if you saw it the way it should be people should be going to the Buddhist definition of self to give us a lens to look at the ego through because the ego this concept of inside me inside you you've got a thing called the ego that has only been around for something in our conversation since Freud's by and large Sigmund Freud was the one who made this a word we could use to talk about ourselves okay it's only been around for a couple hundred years the Buddha talked about the self clearly pointing directly to what he's talking about 2,500 years ago so that's interesting it's not that Buddhism confirms Western psychology it's that Freud and Jung and Carl Rogers and the other theorists the founders of Western psychotherapy Western analytical psychology they are talking about the same thing that the Buddha was talking about in that they both wanted to understand what's going on inside that you can safely say the Buddha has been doing it for a long long time accurately because it comes from what his own experience the Buddha's description of what's going on is experiential he saw contemplated Quan, how things are fundamentally he said pure by nature that is to say nothing to hang on to okay now Freud was a doctor he was trying to help sick people and he said that many emotional problems even physical problems have their roots in complexes in the character in the mind in the invisible parts of our lives he gave them names and said that if you understand them you can go free you can untie the knots that create behavior that you don't want neuroses psychoses paranoia schizophrenia all of these mental illnesses mental illness can go away if you talk it out and understand it thoroughly so brilliant and he it was so important although extremely controversial we're still using a lot of these ideas to this day but understand that the Buddha looked at the same experience and unpacked it in a very consistent system 2,500 years ago we're currently lifting the hood on this car and seeing how that engine works okay everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self attaching to the self Zhao Wo. the problem is thinking it's real in other words can you live with yourself and not attach to it if so you're much freer than you were when you thought it was real and it had to be my way or the highway if you can get rid of the attachment there's no place where 
the self can rest. In other words, there's no more coming into being and no more going away. You're free. This is the answer to the Buddha's quest. Right here. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop ramming this down your throat and ask for some feedback. How about you psychology majors who, you know, studied uh, the, the writings of Freud or maybe you took a, a more uh, holistic approach and read Carl Jung's theories uh, about archetypes. I did. I was very interested in, in Jung. And uh, Jung was interested in Buddhism, interestingly, at the end of his life. Didn't pursue it. He didn't have ex exposure to, uh, to authentic Dharma. Um, but what about this? this if, if this were Thursday night, there would be electricity in the room. Because the Thursday night uh, East Bay Insight Meditation Group is dominated by psychotherapists. They have a, uh, they have a um, occupation directory of everybody who's a regular and fully one third of those folks are psychotherapists who came to meditation because they had heard that there was a method that allowed them to see their mind operating without having to name it neurotic, psychotic, schizophrenic, paranoid, or any of the other pathologies, the sicknesses. The Buddha is a psychotherapist who has a positive spin on what's going on. What is the mental illness that he described? Affliction. And he says, it's just a knot. If you, it links itself, it pulls one or the other. If you untie that knot, the affliction is no more real than any other kind of attachment. Fundamentally, there's nothing there at all. It's just like empty space. Right? And when the psychotherapist say, wow, that's brilliant. Why was Freud so, so pessimistic? You know, why did he have to trace it back to childhood trauma that resulted in you know, in your current neurosis. And the Buddha doesn't stick to illness. He takes the illness away and goes back to nothing at all. And you can experience that if you sit still. So the psychotherapists go, oh boy, if I'd had a course like this during my psychology education, I probably would, you know, I would have been meditating a long time ago because this is good stuff. You get to experience in real time the mind, as the Buddha described it, healthy and functioning. So, Buddhist do-it-yourself psychotherapy, right? That was what the Buddha was about, was healing this fundamental split from all living beings that we carry with the ego. We think we stop here with our skin. The Buddha said, no, no, get rid of the self and you and all 10,000 things are tong ti, same body, da bei, great compassion. Interesting, huh? Ruo li zi zhao, can we live not attached to ourself? Well, you say, what is the self? What is that thing we're talking about? Aha, what is the self? We're going to find out. The 12 links talk about the building blocks of the self. Why I think I really exist here separate from everybody else and everything outside. I'm in here, but you're all outside me. I'm looking out, you're all out there, and I'm, you know, my thoughts are here. And my desires and my fears and my joys, they're really separate and different. That's my experience, right? Buddha says, no, that's a that's a way of seeing the world that you built. That's a construct. You put that together like Legos, like building blocks, like tinker toys. You put that together like a car. 
But you're in there driving, thinking this is your story. This is how your car goes. He says, in fact, you didn't have to. Nothing forced you to do that except habit. Let's unpack it, says the Buddha. Here's how it's made. That's the sixth ground. That's our chapter. Deconstructing our story with me in the center as the hero of the play or the villain, right? If we, what's that? Or the victim, victim, right? We build these stories for ourselves where the world is this way and if it really gets you down, what's the Western thing you do? Go get a shrink, right? Go get analyzed, get some therapy. Okay, well, that's the Western approach. Very helpful in some cases, really, really helpful. Not a bad idea. The Buddha says, yeah, I, I was sick. You know what I was sick with? I was sick with birth and death. I was sick of mortality. I was so sick I was going to die. No doubt about it. He saw that. I need a doctor. So what did he find? The Dharma doctor who allowed him to heal the illness of birth and death. That comes for all of us. How powerful. If we can get rid of our attachment to ourself, birth and death have nowhere to stand. Why? What dies? If the self is already merged with all things. There's only transformation. But nothing dies. Uh. So how important is this? This sentence, if, we could, if I could paint this in its actual significance, the power of this understanding, it's like everything stops with this, right? What does he say? Everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self. Once you're free from that attachment, once you set that attachment down, nothing is reborn. Nothing comes back. It all stops, but it, in the old way. Okay? It's like, oh boy. That's a secret. If we, if we were entrepreneurs, and this was a startup, if this was Alibaba, and we could go IPO with this idea, oh, our shares would be peaking at, what did Alibaba go for yesterday? Some, the largest IPO ever. And this guy, Jack Ma, anybody seen his picture? Jack used to work in a Kentucky Fried Chicken. What was it? Or a sushi shop or something? This little guy in China started up a company called Alibaba in his bedroom in Beijing or Shanghai, I don't know where. And it was the, the most successful IPO on Wall Street in history just yesterday. So we could market this as a product if we saw it for what it was, if we could package it, Buddhists would be very wealthy. And then guess what? Birth and death would have a place to stand, right? Oh, all the trouble began once we did that. So if you understand this and can get it to work for you, you go free. We go free. No further pain required. No further, there's pain, but there's no further suffering. Right? It's not the case that things stop, it's that our attachment to them stops and we merge with them and, as they say in California, go with the flow. No attachments. So there we were um, in Singapore, uh, it was KL, and this guy, this Dharma gunslinger, came in thinking he was going to stop stump Master Hua. You can see this guy was some teacher who had a following. He had special uniforms, you know. In Taiwan, it's full of these, these uh, small teachers who have their, their following. This guy was going to come in and, and have at it with the Chan Master. And so he bowed very ostentatiously, big production of his bow. He goes down and says, Qing Fa Shi Tsu Bei Kai Shi. You know, Please, Dharma Master, be compassionate and teach us all. What is the highest 
What is the highest state? Now, behind this question, you can see the guy was hoping that Scherfer would say something, that this guy could claim it was his state. You know, he was going to, he's a gunslinger. He was a young guy comes into town to shoot it out with the old sheriff, you know. And so Scherfer smiled at him and said, Mayo Church Hall. No attachments. And this guy just, all the air went out of his balloon. It was like, he was so attached to his style and his, you know, stuff. No attachments. And behind that is such a simple Chan master, you know. What did he say? And we kind of went, yeah, yeah, that's just Shurfu. And then it was like, the highest state is not Anuttara, Samyak, Sambodhi. The highest state is not the tenth ground or, you know, Prajnapara. It's no attachments. Shurfu meant it. It wasn't just, you know, you go, oh, I'm attached to everything. Coffee out of the AeroPress tastes better than instant. You know, and it's like, oh man, if my latte doesn't come with two sugars, and if it wasn't raw, unwashed sugar, don't want it, send it back to the barista. We're attached to everything, you know. Here was the elder monk here today talking about what it was like uh, on drawing near to Master Empty Cloud at Yunju Shan uh, when they had to ration the food. He said you he, he you had to read between the lines. And he said back when he was studying with Master Empty Cloud, he said there was there was you had to plan how much food there was. And everybody, how many monks, how many mouths, how much food? You got the same amount, whether you liked a lot or a little. And he said something today that I'd never heard before. <laughs> it's quite a story. He said, you know, how are we attached? How much are we attached? How many think, oh, if only I could have seen Master Xu Yun or bowed to him or heard his Dharma talk, right? We think how wonderful that would have been. The old monk says, oh, Master Xu Yun had a very strong Hunanese accent. You couldn't understand a word he said. <laughs> you go, oh, Master Empty Cloud, please speak Dharma for me. <laughs> Out comes this Hunanese, you know. He's talking and talking and you're like, I don't understand a word he said. So the old monk says, what did he do? He bowed to Guanyin Bodhisattva and asked for a response. Please let me understand Master Empty Cloud's Chinese. And he said after bowing for a long time, he could. He thought that was a real response. Who would think that here's the famous 120-year-old Chan monk, you can't understand a word he says. What about that? I'd ne I hadn't heard that before. I'd never, I'd never heard anybody talk about his speaking book. Okay, here's our homework for next week. Everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self. You get free from that attachment, rebirth is gone. Homework assignment. I want 800 words next week. Uh, no, I want you to think about that and see if you can see that at work in your life. Is that actually, does that... Number one, do we understand what it says? Number two, is that working? Can you see that? How at one, when you at one point were able to not defend yourself and instead take a loss and all of the pain and suffering went away because you were able to so you yeah, just flow with it? That would be an illustration. So the assignment is Number one, see if you can make sense of this. Because I guarantee it's important. This is the Buddha's project. The prince's project. And two, can you see it at work this week? If you, if you can see it, I if you can understand it, I guarantee you'll see it everywhere. Because it's really happening. Because we attach to everything, therefore the wheel of birth and death rolls on. And we suffer to the degree that we're attached. Okay? 
That's our homework. Let's transfer the merit and I'm going to show you some photographs um, of work that has been done down at Highway 9 and a remarkable photograph that we've got to ask Nam to explain. Uh, I got, we'll, we'll tell you in a minute. All right. So let's transfer the merit and then we can look at some pictures. Let's see how well our tuning held here. Pretty good. Okay, here we go. Transfer the merit, make a wish. Now, um, 
What am I doing? Still there. Okay. Um, we are working on our cabin down in the Santa Cruz Redwoods near Boulder Creek. It doesn't have a name yet. We're calling it Highway 9, but that's a cabin on Highway 9. We've owned it because Master Hua uh, heard that the redwoods of California and the world are threatened, that 5% of the redwoods exist. 95% have been cut down a long time ago. The second growth are just barely hanging in. And he said we should do something about that because these are the oldest living, tallest things on the planet. So he uh, uh, instructed us to look into buying pieces of the Santa Cruz forest. So we did that. A cabin came along and on a road called Norwich Road. And we share it with a neighbor whose name is Wesley, Wesley Schroeder. And just our two houses on this one private road north of Boulder Creek. And so the house is kind of livable. I, I lived there for a year during dissertation writing time. And it's, hasn't, it's still there. The roof doesn't leak, but it needs a lot, a lot of work. And Wesley, our neighbor, this uh, uh, gentleman who is uh, very handy, uh, very, he's a contractor and a builder. He uh, recently suggested that we should pave the road because it's a dust. And uh, so uh, Jin Chuan Shi and Nam and Guo Ji and uh, the rest of us have been doing the homework to get uh, to find a contractor to investigate what are the choices of road. So uh, the redwoods are unique in the entire planet. The only part of the world where redwoods grow is this strip of coast from Oregon down to Carmel. And Santa Cruz is where they thrive. And so uh, the last three days, uh, Nam and Guaji and Eric Jha have been down there with Wesley, uh, spending the night, staying there, and getting all the work done uh, to pave the road. Eric pointed his camera at this process, and we got 100 plus photos. So I haven't seen all of these, and uh, I'm going to uh, just run through. Maybe, I don't know, Nam, maybe you could give a commentary to some of this. We've got a, uh, and then could you give Nam the, uh, the mic? Or is the mic out there? We got it? Good. Okay, good. So I'm just going to start clicking on the photos, and you can tell us what we're looking at as we go. This is our driveway going up to our house. That's blacktop. Can I make this full screen or not? Is that it? Or is, can you make these pictures bigger? Do you know what you Yes. Zoom right there. Okay, got it. Got it. That's what I wanted. There. Okay, there we go. Redwood trees. That's the dirt road before. Ooh, there's a bulldozer. Our, our driveway is so steep. That's why the uh, machine, the paver, they could not move up there. And it's so steep, so when the truck, dump truck, if they lift it, they could have tipped over. So the only way to, um, the only way to Pave that is that they dump it down and that bu uh, bucket uh, scoop up the uh, scoop up the asphalt and then they pave it down because okay. the dump truck couldn't get up there. Couldn't get up there. Yeah. On the main road here, the dump truck would back in back to the paver and the paver would just spread it evenly. So up here we're doing semi hand mm -hmm. by hand. Yeah. It's a really steep driveway going up from the road to our house. Caterpillar tractors. Big piles of asphalt. Now, one of the challenges was getting across the bridge because we uh, have a bridge over the San Lorenzo River 
and that's the only way into the property. And that bridge is a little rickety for these very large trucks full of heavy loads of asphalt to cross. But they managed. How do the trucks do getting across? No problem? Um, good thing that we did because yep. when I went down and um, a week before the uh, heavy load, they are like about 25 tons. So the bridge is quite old, so I was concerned. So Koji and I and us, uh, for sure, went down there uh, a week before to shore it up. So um, with uh, railroad ties and brace it. So as we, uh, after uh, several truck went past through, I went down and saw a, a gap, a but, light. So it did going move. through. So actually the, the beam did push the support down and then when it sprung back, so therefore there's a light go through. Okay. But it, it held. It did general. help. It held, yeah. It's a good thing we did that. So beautiful photos of the light down there. And you can see, here's the road. You ever see a road from the side? That's four inches, huh? That is uh, over, yes. Originally we ordered for three inches, but the sun, he's generous. He make a mistake, so he gave us four inches. <laughs> That's right. Hongda <laughs> Wuliang, Limitless Merit and Virtue. Here's a road through the redwoods. So nice. That, that is to the pool out. This, this is uh, the, right there down at the bottom of our road, huh? No, that is, the cabin is on... Oh, this is on the top. There's the, a cabin yes, right that's there. the cabin oh, porch. Oh, it looks so different now. That's beautiful. This used to be, you just gun your engine and go running up there unless you had four-wheel drive and try your best. Now we actually can get up there and park. And beautiful. Oh, that's so nice. Look at that. So a good, a good uh, contractor. It's a good thing we went with them in the end. Yes. Good guys. That's the edge of our building. Look at that. Professional job. How nice. Great. And then we go down a little bit to the parking. Okay, now look at this machine. This is a paving machine. How did this yes. get across the bridge? Pretty amazing. Sideways. Oh. oh. There's, okay, you have to bend your neck, but here's our cabin. And this before was hard to get up. You had to rush. That is uh, one of the victim <laughs> get get dropped into the hot asphalt and get embedded. Omidofo. It's a lizard, huh? Yes, a baby lizard. Uh-huh. Who that? So this will make it possible for those of you who have a sedan or a car that's not meant for off-road to go down to Highway 9 with us and drive up and uh, have lunch and then join our sessions. We are going to be developing this. Uh, here's, you see the shadow of the deck up in the second floor here? We're going to be developing this piece of ground and uh, making it our retreat space. People who have gone with us to Oregon and driven for 10 hours to get up to Buddha Root Farm will now uh, be able to join us down in Boulder Creek, which is an hour and a half. Um, so we can do a day long or a weekend or longer. Ooh, look at these. <laughs> My goodness. Look at the size of that vehicle. You can join us and uh, much less difficulty in time lost in transportation. So, Nam, did they pave this parking area down here? No, that wasn't uh, part of the wasn't contract. Of yep. But the contractor did um, said that uh, he will clear it for us for free. So That's nice. 
So we did have uh, uh, opened up a, a great deal, gain a lot of space, and push all the brush uh, nice. further forward so it can park a, nice. a lot more cars. Yeah. So here's the, uh, the what do you call this, the, the tamper or the? That's a roller. Roller, yeah. Okay, now uh, here's the hard work in getting it really flat so when water falls on it, when it rains on it, it'll run off evenly. Look at this whole crew. How many guys did they send? They have about seven people. Wow, seven people. Look at the size of this road. That's amazing, huh? Asphalt that thick. And it goes on hot. This is not easy work at all. So we went down the road, half, half a mile down is Wesley Schroeder, Wesley and Darlene, his wife, our neighbors. Okay, so here's what it looks like when you come up. This is finished. Here's our, this is our new parking area up by the cabin. We're considering the possibility of building a Yangtai back here. This is the southern side. The, the, you see the mountain goes up. We're considering maybe leveling a little bit of this and, and making a uh, platform so that we can meditate out there, eat out there, have a, our Dharma talks out there. So that would be, we're talking about the slope going up this way. Pretty steep. But I think it's uh, got a real future, real possibility. All right, down through the redwoods. Here is Wesley, here's our neighbor, an old Texas gentleman, very uh, bright spirit and really likes, although he wouldn't call himself a Buddhist, he's definitely got insight and, and wisdom into the Dharma. Here is Wesley's home. He built it by hand. He's a stonemason, he's a contractor, he's a carpenter. that big stump of the first growth redwood. Every day at four o'clock, the deer come by. Wesley has a herd of deer that he feeds, some by hand. They're very punctual. They come on time every day. See the stonework? He did all that by himself. That's his workshop. Here's his garage for parking vehicles. There they are. Okay, that's great. Now, um, there's something that's a little less great, but maybe has a little bit of magic involved, and we need to ask Nam about that, um, tell me the story behind this guy. I saw Guoji come in today and I said, Guoji, how'd it go? He said, did you see the snake? And I said, no. And he said, Nam found this guy. Where was he? I, the contractor showed me how to use his uh, tractor, and uh, I took the opportunity to move the big log and um, uh, clearing that area opposite, away from our, opposite with our driveway, yeah. and uh, disturb the home of, of this guy, this snake. So I stopped, I, I, I uh, took him away and put him away. So before I do that, I took some pictures. You what? You took I, him away and put him away? What does that mean? I, which means that I took a stick and then I lift him up, I put him over to a safe area so that I don't um, just, uh, you know, <laughs> hurt him. Hurt him with the this, uh, this, this, machine. To me, that looks about seven feet long. No, it's about five feet. Only about five feet. Uh -huh. Yes. Is, is it a rattlesnake? No, 
He's it's a, just a gardener's garden. That's snake. a garter snake? Yes. But it's a big one. Uh, yeah. That's a garter snake? Yes. Oh, is it the photo that makes it look so huge? Uh, could be, yes. Good grief. Look at this critter. So we, we saw that and we thought maybe this is like the snake spirit of the woods or something. No, but it... See, he's here's right. just going, mmm, yummy dinner. Look at that snake. This is a snake-eating bird. Good thing they don't live together. So that's fascinating. So he came out of a log down yes. that, that yes. in that parking space. Huh? In that parking space. Okay. He is probably a hufa, probably a dharma protector. I think that's the case. Okay, well, I'm glad you didn't uh, disturb him any more than necessary. Master Hua's advice to me was, Don't mess with them. They've got a real spirit. So. Okay, so thank you for watching our photos. Uh, Yuanlin, you want to bring that back up? This is, uh, we have a future down in those redwoods, and uh, if you stay, if everybody stays tuned, we're going to be developing, we're going to be giving you more news of what's going on down at our property off of Highway 9. And in the future, um, hope we'll, you'll be able to join us for events down there. So, uh, announcements include bicycle pilgrimage. The Buddhist bicycle pilgrimage called Dharma Wheels is going to... Hey, Chin Chuan, could you give me the flyer? It's, it's there on the board. I want to give you facts. This is a, an annual event that happens uh, in Northern California. I think it's quite wonderful. Whenever I describe this to people in the world outside, they laugh. And uh, it's right there on the edge of the blunt board. Yeah. And it, the writers, I th can you still sign up, Locke? Is it too late? Or? As a volunteer? Okay. If, um, here it is. It's the 13th annual Buddhist Bicycle Pilgrimage. Next weekend, September 27th, to the 28th. It's two days. You cover 137 miles. And it says, join our Sangha on wheels for a spiritual pilgrimage to four Buddhist centers. You can experience the pilgrimage as a rider or as a volunteer with your family and friends. This event is made possible through the heartfelt efforts of giving volunteers your kind, of giving volunteers and your kind donations. We go to Spirit Rock, we go to Sai Tao Win, Burmese place, City of 10,000 Buddhas, and Abhayagiri. And the nuns of Aloka Bihara will be going along, speaking Dharma at night, camping out at, at, uh, under the stars. And lunch on Sunday is at CTTB. And then the conclusion of the pilgrimage is Abhayagiri, where the monks greet people. So it's, it's a unique way to cultivate on bicycles, and you can see uh, four monasteries in Northern California. It's very cool. So um, I'm going to go up and greet them when they arrive on Sunday at CTDB, speak Dharma for them. And many, many, many of the riders have never been to a Mahayana monastery. And they come in and they're like, wow, look at all these Buddhas here. And then they feed them vegetables, and, and uh, it's a good experience. So if anybody's interested, in finding out more, there's a website. If you are interested in riding and you've never done it before, it's going to be too much for you, 137 miles. Um, if you're a middle distance rider and enjoy bike riding, this might be something you'd love. So do check it out. Um, what other announcements do we have? We had our elder master, uh, Xuan Hui, also called Chan Dao, come here today. Uh, from China. Could anybody understand him right off? YC, did you understand his? A few sentences. Say, so you, you realize what? Oh, okay. 
Okay. You'd heard of him before? No. no. Okay. Sandy, do you understand his Chinese? No, I had to guess. You had to guess. Okay. Correct. He couldn't understand. They're both from Hunan and they couldn't understand each other. Alan, did you get him? Could you understand? And? Only a few words. He's speaking Chinese, right? No, he's speaking Hunan dialect. And the, uh, the translator, Mr. Zhang, was getting pretty much all of it. But how, you know, that's amazing. I was thinking, no matter where in America, even if he talk like this, he pretty much understand what they're saying, although it sounds kind of funny, you know, it's like. Or if, if uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, says John Kennedy with his Boston Brahmin accent, you know. And in Maine, they say, oh, you know, take, a right, take a right down there, stranger. And that's Maine accent, you know, and... But you can still understand, still English, you can still understand it. In Chinese, Hunanese, you need a translator. <laughs> and the Hunanese monk says he could not understand Master Xu Yun's Hunanese. <laughs> oh boy, that's pretty amazing. I can understand uh, Hui, I can understand, I can, uh, no, I don't understand. I can hear the difference between Hui Vietnamese and northern, and Hunei, Hanoi, I, can, I know it's different. And I've heard people have you know, helped me understand Saigon, the south from the central. I'd, but you can mutually understand each other, right? You un, there's, it's not a problem, it's just an accent. Well, this accent is so thick, it's, un, it's unintelligible. How amazing that is. How amazing. So, yeah. You have to be from there to get it. Huh? Not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, you can be from there and not get it, but if you... I was listening to him, and uh, I was thinking, there are people who... He's not the only one who talks like this. There's a lot of people who talk like this. And when he's there, they get it just fine. But not us. You know. Yeah. No, the translator... He was kind of, he wouldn't tell me where he's from. He studied everywhere. He studied in Shanghai, studied in Beijing, studied... Blah, 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 blah. But, um, but he was understanding it somehow. Were, were you here? And, and how are you doing with it? Any, any hope? Some words, yeah. There were some words that sounded like Mandarin. Listen to that. You, but Laura, you couldn't understand him though. If you were translating. No, I had no hope. I got nothing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So YC is saying it because it was the first time we heard that dialect. But the translator is used to it, so it's better. But still, goodness. Now, this old gentleman um, spent 13 years on the top of a mountain farming, hiding out during the Cultural Revolution. So you know that he is, he is not a city monk. He's not a internet monk. He's, he's not used to communication. He talks to the, the plants and the earth and the, the birds. So um, in the world of ethnomusicology, He's the one you're looking for. If you have a tape recorder and you're trying to catch the old songs that are pure, that came over from England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and went to the Appalachians and didn't change, if you want to hear how the old music was back in the 1700s, he's the one you want. You go record him. Why? Untouched by modernity. Right? The modern world has not touched that old gentleman. And that's why his dialect is so, you know, impeccable. We say uh, the Dharma nature is pure. That's what we mean, meaning unstained by contact with other things. So the problem is, what is he saying? I can't understand it. You know. Are there Dutch dialects that are... Really? What is it? 
truly. So, and Holland is a, such a small place, you know, and yet there are dialects and places where Scottish, there are Scottish brogues that are un, unintelligible. There was a monk at, at Amravati who was, his name was Arthur, uh, and uh, he was, everybody laughed because he would come down and speak Dharma and everybody would shake their heads, you know. Utman, you know. So, yeah. Anyhow, how wonderful. So we had a chance to uh, see a little piece of Buddhist history. Good old monk. The nun, anyone talk to the nun? She came from Inner Mongolia. That was Ni Mongol, from Guanyin Si and Baotou. How amazing to have, eat lunch with somebody from Inner Mongolia who's a Buddhist nun. And she invited us to go there and take part, come and take a look at the Caoyuan, at the steps at the grass plain, the grasslands, the prairie of Mongolia. All right, see you next week. Have a wonderful week of cultivation and blessings and look into your homework and think about where the self stands once we drop our attachments. The answer is nowhere. It comes to an end. to the Venerable Master. Bye.